for generators, set of generators, so the elements and their inverses. There, the assertion is that there exists a G and G such that, well, the distance from, this is the hyperbolic distance. We talked about that on Monday. It's given by the minimum of the integral of all the paths between the two points of Dr. Bob Patrick. So if you took your point ZI along the way, remember it's iterative, and you measure the distance from Z0, and I assert that there's one when I apply G, I'm closer. And by its very nature, if you repeat this, because uh, the group gamma is discrete, um, you'll end up with a discrete set of points in the upper half plane. Therefore, this algorithm has to terminate. The set of distances um, is finite. Once it's been bounded in any compact set, you only have finitely many elements of the group. So ZR equals Z0, and then you get a real <coughs> just like we had before. Okay? There's optimizations for those of you thinking algorithmically. There are better ways of doing it here too. This is also kind of the order and checks, and there's there's also better way. You can you can know, you can find out which element to apply by looking in the unit disk and seeing what the angle is. Yeah. 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 What's up? Sorry, this is a dumb question, but why is the stabilizer Z zero? Oh well, um, at the end here you have an identity. Ident this good question. Not, no, no questions are done. Um, if, if, let's say uh, after all of this effort, I end up with, so I start with uh, gamma, and then I have my bunch of generators, right? I start with Z0, and then I apply my gamma, and then I'm a Z, Z1, and then I have all these weird generators. I don't know what they're, they're going to be called, uh, G1 up to GR. Okay? The conclusion that I have is that, is this. So then, the product G1 up through C, GR up to G1 gamma, well, the conclusion is that this belongs to stabilizer. So strictly speaking, if you knew what the stabilizer was, you could say, hey, which one of the elements of the stabilizer you are, and then you would get a you get equally well an identity of your group, so no bigs. But it's also, it's a bit nice, since you've got the pick your Z0, nice to pick your Z0. Oh, man, that was so much fun. Okay. Any questions? Okay, now you, you own, <coughs> bless you, finite index subgroups, that's helps you. Whatever pictures you want to draw, explicitly you want to work with them, um, you can. You know what they look like. Yeah. So can you quickly take on the way to like easily identify whether an element is in gamma or not? So that's why Sage is not accepting, for example, if a PD or static journal is this for gamma. Yeah, because it doesn't know if it belongs to the group or not. Some th that's that can be tricky though. Do you know how all of mathematics is incorrect? there are undecidable problems of that nature? So you have to be a little bit careful. Um, if you promise me that your subgroup is something of finite index in SL2Z, then there is also an algorithm that will work. I'm sorry that it's not in Sage, but it goes like this. You just write out all the words of your group, keep writing them, and you take you compute something which is called a Dirichlet domain. So you keep track of all of the all of the points that are closest to your favorite point in the upper half. Like maybe it's two lines. Okay. So you keep writing, you keep writing, you keep writing. What ends up what ends happening is you'll end up with uh, so this is your favorite Z zero. So this is a, this is a way to, to get back to having tested. So you say, okay, maybe I wrote down an element of the group, and I want to take all the points that are close, that are, it's, it's this kind of inequality. I take all the points that un, under gamma are closer, the identity is closer than the G. So you'll end up with things that look like this. So you have all these elements, they are cutting out right pieces, and eventually they no longer contribute to the cuts anymore. And once you have that, you've constructed a Dirichlet domain, what's called a Dirichlet domain for the group, and then you still will end up with side pairing elements and all of those. Okay, so that's not, it's not a very simple algorithm. It's not designed for that, but uh, there, there exists an algorithm that takes as input a set of generators of a discrete subgroup of PSL2R and outputs the holy coordinate. Okay, what else? Yes, I
You guys want to do some homology now? I'll do some of this. Okay. Probably I have no time left. Yeah, typical. saw how important it was to keep track of paths in the other, upper half plane as a way of understanding discrete groups and the uh, object which tries to keep track of those paths more than just for the fundamental domain but with applications of homology and modular forms is something called a modular symbol. Okay? So in other words we're going to keep track of the homology class of these paths they're not strictly speaking in the homology yet, because we don't know that they map up to loops, but they're homology relative to the cusps. So we're going to draw geodesics in the upper half plane with bound endpoints along the circle at infinity. We're going to keep track of the group action on those paths, and the magistry is that that tells us the information we want to know about our group, modular forms, etc. Okay? So take two elements, alpha, beta, and P1, Q. This is Q union infinity. The modular symbol or alpha beta is okay. Well, people write it alpha beta, and that's confusing because you probably are thinking that that's a set, and I can't change that. If you want to, you can put underlines here, or dots, or make it green, or whatever, but you're just going to have to realize that it is not a set. The order matters, okay? The modular symbol, it is the, <coughs> bless you, the homology class of, you don't, if you don't know about homology, you do not need to understand what's in parentheses, but for those of you who do, then I'm going to use that word because it helps you to understand what we're doing. You know, well, okay, you'll see what I mean. Path from alpha to beta in the completed upper half plane relative to the cusps. Okay, that just means to say that we allow paths with endpoints. In okay, what is the point that I'm taking here? Well, uh, if I were to draw a path in the upper half plane between my alpha and beta, of course, one of these could be infinity, but this is the generic case. Um, there are lots of ways of drawing paths from alpha to beta. That's the content of the word homology class. Okay? There is a favorite one. It's called the geodesic. Okay? So you can take that as your representative path, which is why that's not important. But maybe later on we're going to compose the things and then we'll want to see that as being the unique geodesic. So you have to keep in track that this is also equally well a representative of the symbol alpha beta. In homology, you take loops, and I'm saying that you do not need to take loops. In fact, we are, well, you can if you want to. Alpha and beta could be equal at this point, but I'm, I'm allowing you to that not to be a loop, so it's called relative homology. Hey, probably my Dartmouth cohort, you have to suffer through relative homology. If you have a complex, and then you have a subcomplex, and then you take the relative homology, good times. <laughs> now, what can you tell me about, there's a homology relation, Again, for those of you who know homology, I'm saying that because I want to, that's the rules of the important concept in topology that I want you to, for those of you who don't, just think about that word as being, I'm going to define each of the, what I mean. So the homology relation is, well, if I do alpha beta, and then beta gamma, and then I go back, I, I don't, I haven't made a path. I, I have something which is homologous to the identity. Is declared to be satisfied, how about that? So for those of you thinking abstractly, I'm now making some enormous group generated by the symbols alpha and beta for alpha, beta, and P1, Q, 
and I declare the homology relation star to be satisfied. And that is if, uh, the picture. I could go to the gamma, and then I go back, and I declare that to be the trivial, to be trivial in my group. Okay. So um, the uh, let's make a Q vector space. Is that okay? Rather than a viewing group, it'll be easier with keeping track of ranks, and then we don't have to throw out torsion, which everyone always does. Okay. So we let M two. This is the space of modular symbols. be the Q vector space. The basis the modular symbols. With the alpha beta in P1 Q. Modulo the subspace generated by Star. And that is the, that is the, and that's okay. I, I mean, you could take an abelian group here, but then I'm not off by torsion. So I want, let's take two vector spaces. I take some uh, really big vector space generated by a huge number of symbols, and then I have a subspace generated by these guys, and I take the quotient of those two vector spaces. Okay, so you can always think about it as actual modular symbols, modulo relations like. Okay, how big is this thing? It's an enormous vector space, okay? Enormous. Um, what else can you deduce from star? Well, I encourage you to conclude, to prove that for any alpha, I have alpha alpha equals zero, and that alpha beta is minus beta alpha. See if you can prove that for alpha beta. Okay, that follows from star. Now, uh, we are going to act on this enormous vector space by our discrete groups gamma. The fairy symbols and other coset representatives are going to help us to keep track of that action, and there's going to be the mystery. Okay, so we just made an object, a linear algebra object, that's going to keep track of our nonlinear group actions, and uh, that's going to be awesome. Okay, so now let's have our group act. Everyone okay with our modular symbols, M2? Okay, how's it going to act? Well, there's a natural action, right? If I take a G in my group, and I want to have it act on a modular symbol, it can act by linear fractional transformations on the alpha and beta, right? LFTs. You know me. Okay, so heads up, we're going to integrate along these paths. So that's the reason why we want to take some uh, G invariance. Okay, so here comes all important lemma. Perfect. So M2 is spanned by a special kind of symbol. Um, by a special kind of symbols. And these symbols are. I take the path from 0 to infinity, but I'm going to write it as infinity to 0 to make the argument a little bit easier. And I have gamma act, where gamma is in S, uh, gamma form. So it's possible. Okay. So all of the alpha, beta on the planet, if I look at the symbol alpha, beta, I could have gotten that just by applying a matrix in SL2Z to the single symbol gamma zero. So in other words, if you want to think about this vector space as not just a giant vector space, but a vector space equipped with the action of this SL2Z, then it has a canonical generator, uh, infinity zero. I don't know how canonical it is. It's canonical if you declare it to be. <laughs> okay. Now that's not, an, that's not obvious, this lemma. Okay, but it will be after I show you the proof. The proof is continued fractions, the Euclidean algorithm, um, that's good stuff. Okay, so first of all, if I take my alpha beta, I can write it as alpha zero minus beta zero. 
by the homology relation. If I want to go from alpha to beta, I could go first alpha to zero, and then zero to beta, and then I write that in the other way. Okay, so we show for, it's enough to, to show this spanning condition, we can show it for alpha zero. If alpha is equal to infinity, boy, are we all set. Otherwise, our alpha is in Q, and the magical step here is that you take the continued fraction, and its convergence. Okay, so the first step in the continued fraction is uh, just the floor of alpha, <coughs> so that will give me some integer a zero. This b zero is going to be equal to one because I just taken the floor there. Okay. And then I write out the other convergence of this fraction until I represent my alpha. There's no about continued fractions. So you take the floor, subtract off the floor, plus one over the next thing, and then you get an integer, and so on and so on. And that's another unique way of writing. And it, usually you do that in the context of uh, quadratic irrationalities. You notice the periodicity of that continued fraction expansion that tells you something about solutions to Pell's equations and the fundamental unit. In a real quadratic field, I don't want to do any of that. I just want you to do it for a rational number right now. So this is a finite continued fraction expansion. And if you've never seen this before, you have lots of fun exercise periods to, this afternoon to go and read up on basic properties of continued fractions. You can think about the continued fraction expansion as coming from the Euclidean algorithm. So the convergence are related in that important way. That's, that's why I also call it that. So here's another important property, the, the convergence. So they satisfy this relation. Okay, so that, that's one of the things I'm going to ask you to check if you haven't seen that before. And now I'm just going to write out the relation in homology that comes from writing out the continued fraction expansion. Okay, that, that's just a trivial concept, not trivial, I hate that word. That is a consequence of the star fundamental relation, just because I wrote each term repeating each, so I just broke up the symbol, and inserted it to divide it up the path according to each of the rational numbers. But now the point is that because I have this relation, if I wrote down the matrix with these entries, there's determinant plus or minus one, and even better than that, well these are all integers, right? Well, I wrote down a fraction, continued fraction expansion, so I wrote them as rational numbers there. So you can write this as gamma n infinity 0 plus dot 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 plus gamma 1 infinity 0. And then I have to do a little bit of futzing around here with, to take care of the integers. But there, I'm assert, they'll serve with. So the gamma i's are defined in this way. They are a i. You have to take care of the signs to make it all work, but you can. just. Uh, Take the negative of one of the columns instead. And then for this gamma zero, I make a special matrix to deal with the last step. Okay? So uh, is, that, is that clear? The, the, I just wrote down the explicit matrices. You can see how you deal with the determinant minus one. But I, the continued fraction expansion gives you adjacent fractions. Does it look like very simple stuff? Okay, they are all. Telling the, trying to tell you the same, the same meta idea, and here we're seeing in a very concrete, efficient way. So if I gave you random alpha, beta, how hard is it to write it as a sum of symbols of the form gamma uh, infinity zero? No harder than computing this continued fraction expansion. And if you read more, you can see how that's related to the Euclidean, the, uh, um, the Euclidean algorithm for A over B. So this alpha, beta, after you write it as alpha over zero, I have A over B, and these be the fraction expansion probably over time. Yeah. Oh, I'm not too happy over time. Okay, um, I'm not going to keep going. I just want to see what else is next. 
Okay, so next time we're going to take our finite index subgroup of PSL2C, have it act on this space of modular symbols, look at the basis there. That is trying to tell you about the homology of the curve, the homology of the curve can tell us things like the genus, and more than that, uh, finally there'll be some HECA operators, and that will allow us to relate to modular forms. Okay, so thanks. That's all for today.